Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. As he waited there for either the bombs to stop or to die, he purportedly began to get the very strong feeling that he was being watched, that eyes were lying heavily upon him, a feeling that would evolve into a palpable sense of thick dread. Sitting there alone in the dark, Leland reportedly shone his flashlight up to the top of the stairs and caught in its beam the horrifying sight of what looked like a massive cat-like beast crouching at the topmost step with large, incandescent eyes and horns protruding from its head. Leland would later explain that the monstrous entity had seemed to exude icy waves of an aura of evil and that its unblinking eyes had had a hypnotic quality that held him in a trance. As he sat there transfixed by the entity's gaze, it suddenly leapt from the step to come pouncing down towards him as an unearthly howl reverberated through the still air. Yet before it hit the ground, it seemed to evaporate into thin air, breaking him from whatever spell it had kept him in. At that same moment, he said that he had heard human voices and footsteps, and that some of his fellow ARP members had then emerged from the gloom to his rescue. Leland told them what had happened in a panic but none of the other men reported having come across anything strange in the house and had not heard the bone-chilling wail he described. However, much to Leland's surprise, some of the other men in the unit claimed that a very similar, shadowy, cat-like beast with horns and glowing eyes had been spotted by others in the same vicinity. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Among the various mysterious creatures sighted and reported throughout the world, there is one very distinctive category and this is that of living dinosaurs, prowling the forests and jungles of our world as if they were never gone at all. Such fantastic reports come from a variety of places, in particular Africa with its saurian Mokele Mbembe and others. But another lesser-known location for accounts of supposed surviving dinosaurs is the wilds of South America. Here, among the jungles and even deserts of South America's remote wilderness have come truly bizarre accounts that seem to suggest that dinosaurs are perhaps alive and well, 
still stomping across the landscape as they always have. Some rather cryptic reports came from the famed explorer Percy Fawcett, who is most well known for his ambitious and ill-fated expedition in 1925 to find a lost city he was convinced existed in the forgotten depths of the Amazon jungle, a journey during which he would vanish off the face of the earth to become one of the most baffling disappearances in history. But that's a story for a different time. But one of the more interesting aspects of Fawcett's adventures are all of the strange and mysterious creatures he allegedly encountered along the way. Among the cyanide-shooting millipedes, acid-spewing ants, double-nosed dogs, cat-dog hybrids and giant snakes and giant spiders, it also seems that he may very well have seen and heard of actual living dinosaurs out there in the badlands of those murky, unexplored jungles. Some of these accounts were told to him by others, such as an account he wrote of in a letter in 1919 in which he writes of a strange dinosaur-like creature supposedly lurking in the jungles of Bolivia. The letter said, A friend of mine, a trader in the rivers and for whose honesty I can vouch, saw in somewhere about latitude 12 south and longitude 65 west, Bolivia, Brazil, borderland, the head and neck of a huge reptile of the character of the brontosaurus. It was a question of who was scared most, for it precipitately withdrew with a plunging which suggested an enormous bulk. The savages appear to be familiar with the existence and tracks of the beast, although I have never come across any of the latter myself. The swamps over immense areas are virtually impenetrable. Fawcett made another brief mention in his many notes of something very strange, large, and seemingly very much like a dinosaur in the wilds of Bolivia, of which he wrote, some mysterious and enormous beast has frequently been disturbed in the swamps, possibly a primeval monster like those reported in other parts of the continent. Certainly tracks have been found belonging to no known animal, huge tracks, far greater than could have been made by any species we know. It is maddeningly brief and lacking in detail, which was a bit odd for Fawcett, who normally went to great lengths to take meticulous and detailed notes during his expeditions. There was also the fact that this creature, whatever it was, is mentioned nowhere else in his journals and is not brought up again, making it frustratingly unclear as to what exactly he saw out there in those uncharted jungles. Percy also at several points mentions hearing from natives of enormous, mysterious tracks along the Acre River near where the borders of Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil collide, although these people had never actually seen the elusive creature that made the prince. Another early explorer of South America who wrote of possibly living dinosaurs in the region was a German by the name of Franz Hermann Schmidt, who in October of 1907 was exploring the inhospitable Peruvian interior along with a Captain Rudolf Flang and some native guides. Upon coming to a valley, they claim they found an area along the Solimes River to be oddly devoid of any water animals such as alligators and aquatic snakes, or indeed any life at all, and they came across some unusual massive footprints in the mud. The guides reportedly became quite upset and agitated at this discovery and warned them to head back, but they apparently camped there anyway. The next day, fresh tracks were purportedly found along the river near the camp, and Flang announced that he decided that he was going to follow them to see where they led. Shortly after this, there was a commotion in the jungle as the monkeys and birds screamed and shrieked, and a large, dark shape crashed about in the brush which sent one of the spooked Indian guides scurrying for safety in one of the canoes. Schmidt would write of the incident, One of the excited Indians began to paddle the boat away from the shore, and before we could stop him we were a hundred feet from the waterline. Now we could see nothing, and the Indians absolutely refused to put in again while neither Flang nor myself cared to lay down our rifles to paddle. There was a great moving of plants and a sound like heavy slaps of a great paddle 
mingled with the cries of some of the monkeys moving rapidly away from the lake. For a full ten minutes, there was silence. Then the green growth began to stir again, and coming back to the lake, we beheld the frightful monster that I shall now describe. The head appeared over bushes ten feet tall. It was about the size of a beer keg and was shaped like that of a tapir, as if the snout was used for pulling things or taking hold of them. The eyes were small and dull and set in like those of an alligator. Despite the half-dried mud, we could see that the neck, which was very snake-like, only thicker in proportion, was rough-knotted like an alligator's side rather than his back. Evidently, the animal saw nothing odd in us, if he noticed us, and advanced till he was no more than 150 feet away. We could see part of the body, which I should judge to have been eight or nine feet thick at the shoulders, if that word may be used, since there were no forelegs, also some great heavy clawed flippers. The surface was like that of the neck. It's all rather dramatic and harrowing enough to be sure, but it apparently got even more so when Flang whipped his rifle up and took a shot at it, as it seems humans are wont to do when facing the unknown, which apparently ricocheted off its bony head. Schmidt also fired at it, and this time had hit it in the base of the neck, which also seemed to have little effect. According to Schmidt's account, they then began unloading their weapons on the massive creature in unison, which sent it fleeing into the muddy water. Schmidt would say of what happened next, "...as quickly as we could fire, we pumped seven shots into it, and I believe all struck. They seemed to annoy the creature, but not to work any injury." Suddenly, it plunged forward in a silly, clumsy fashion. The Indians nearly upset the dugout getting away, and both Flang and I missed the sight as it entered the water. I was very anxious to see its hind legs, if it had any. I looked again, only in time to see the last of it leave the land, a heavy, blunt tail with rough, horny lumps. The head was visible still, though the body was hidden by the splash. From the instant's opportunity, I should say that the creature was 35 feet long, with at least 12 of this devoted to head and neck. In three seconds, there was nothing to be seen except the waves of the muddy water, the movements of the waterside growth, and a monkey with its hind parts useless hauling himself up a treetop. As the Indians paddled frantically away, I put a bullet through the poor thing to let it out of its misery. We had not gone a hundred yards before Flang called to me and pointed to the right. Above the water, an eighth of a mile away, appeared the head and neck of the monster. It must have dived and gone right under us. After a few seconds' gaze, it began to swim toward us, and, as our bullets seemed to have no effect, we took flight in earnest. Losing sight of it behind an island, we did not pick it up again and were just as well pleased. It is certainly a very spectacular account, made all the weirder as it appears within an otherwise rather nondescript, even dull account of the expedition that is all rather credible and ordinary for the most part. It has been suggested that perhaps this report was an addition slipped in later, or that Schmidt just made up the story to liven things up, but there is no way to tell. It remains another lost historical account buried in a forgotten explorer's notes, with no way of checking its veracity and forever will linger in the realm of speculation. Although Schmidt and company, according to the report, failed to slay the alleged savage beast, there have been other instances when a dinosaur of some sort was actually supposedly killed. A very dramatic report from the 19th century was included in an 1883 issue of Scientific American in an article titled A Bolivian Saurian, in which the Brazilian minister at La Paz, Bolivia, claimed that a very odd beast had been shot and killed in a remote area of the Benai River. The article would say of this, The Brazilian minister of La Paz, Bolivia, had remitted to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Rio photographs of drawings of an extraordinary saurian killed on the Benai after receiving 36 balls. By order of the President of Bolivia, the dried body, which had been preserved in a sunction, was sent to La Paz. The monster was reported to be 12 meters long, or 39 feet, 
from snout to point of the tail, which latter was flattened. Its head resembles the head of a dog and its legs were short, ending with formidable claws. The legs and abdomen sported a kind of scale armor, and all the back is protected by a still thicker and double cuirass, starting from behind the ears of the anterior head and continuing to the tail. The neck is long and the belly large and almost dragging on the ground. The bizarre report is somewhat plausible as it appeared in a mostly respectable publication rather than on just a slow news day giving it a bit of weight. The question is, what was this creature and where did the carcass go? Or was it all a hoax? No one really knows. Other explorers would encounter similar bizarre beasts in the years after. Less than a decade after Fawcett's doomed expedition, there was an account from 1931 by explorer Harold Weston, who claimed to have seen a 20-foot-long serpentine reptile like a snake but with stumpy legs along Brazil's remote Rio Memore. Then, in 1946, there was the account of explorer Leonard Clark, who was traveling up Brazil's Rio Perine when he reportedly heard from the region's natives of a type of large, long-necked animal in the area that fed on plants. Such strange accounts have persisted up until more recent years as well. In 1975, a Swiss businessman visited the Amazon and became acquainted with a local guide by the name of Sebastian Bastos, who spoke of immense long-necked beasts similar in appearance to dinosaurs that were known by the natives and which lurked in deep parts of the river. Bastos would claim that one of his canoes had actually been destroyed by one of these monsters. Between the years of 1977 and 1980, a Silvano Lorenzoni claimed in a series of articles that there had been spotted plesiosaur-like things in a lake atop a high plateau called Ollantapui in southeastern Venezuela. He also said that such plateaus had produced other reports of enormous reptilian creatures like something out of Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World, but his claims are all rather vague. Also, as recently as 1995 was an account given by a group of geology students who came across two huge 30-foot-long creatures with long necks wading in the Paraguacu River in the Sincora mountain range of eastern Brazil. One rather recent series of sightings of what seems to be a dinosaur of some sort began in July of 2004 in the moonscape of the Atacama Desert area of Chile. The first sighting that made the news was that of a car full of people driving the main road linking Ikiwiki and Erika during the evening. Within the vehicle were a Chilean army official named Hernan Cuevas, his wife and his two young children, and another man named Dario Riquelme. They were about 17 kilometers outside of Arica when what appeared to be two gray, hairless, bipedal lizards about seven feet high with short arms and which, according to Cuevas, was a huge beast, much like a two-legged dinosaur with huge thighs, appeared out of the wasteland around them. The bizarre creatures allegedly sped across the road with swift strides to disappear into the night, and they apparently stopped the car in shock and looked around, but they could not find the creature again. However, they did find that they had left behind strange three-toed footprints. In that very same month, another sighting came in of something similar in the same area. The Abet de la Torre Diaz family was driving along the same road at just about the same time in the evening when they claimed that two six-foot-high creatures resembling dog-faced kangaroos jumped clear over their car with amazing agility, and that two more of the beasts then materialized from the dark to dart across the road as if they were traveling in a pack. The startled witnesses did not see them for long, but mentioned that prominent, sharp teeth were plainly visible. They apparently found a picture in a book of what resembles the creature they saw, and this was a type of dinosaur called a dromaeosaurid. These reports prompted the TV show Destination Truth to travel to the region to investigate in 2009, and during their research they found that apparently other sightings of the same creatures 
had been made by other motorists as well in the same area, earning the creature the name the Arica Monster. The team also talked to a paleontologist at the University of Terrapaca named Keodero Santoro, who believes that it is possible that some sort of theropod could have remained undetected in the vast Atacama Desert and that it could survive in this harsh environment as long as it had enough food, water, and vegetation. The problem is there is very little of any of these things in the Atacama Desert. It's one of the harshest, most inhospitable environments on Earth, and this makes it difficult to figure out what these people could have possibly seen, if anything. With its vast expanses of little explored jungles and isolated remote areas, South America seems like just the sort of place where one might expect to find living dinosaurs, if such a thing exists. Yet among all of these reports, there is very little evidence at all, other than witness testimony and the nature of such sightings is so sporadic that we are left to wonder just what these people actually did see, if they indeed saw anything at all. We're left to merely speculate on these scattered accounts and wonder if the lost worlds of South America hold beasts from another age, still looming over the landscape as they did millions of years ago. Only the trees and the jungle creatures that crawl, skitter, and squirm through the trees and swamps really know for sure, whispering among themselves the answers we seek. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Many, many, many years ago, I was working with a demolition team who were taking down an old hotel in London. The hotel had been in operation for many years, but it had become dilapidated and needed ripping down and a new building put in its place. It had been a dance hall during the pre-war period, and at night the watchmen would complain of strange noises. One night watchman told me that the first night he had spent on the job had been one of the most terrifying nights of his life. He had almost called the police. Naturally, I wanted to know why. He explained that he'd been on watch for nine hours. In that nine hours, he had heard voices, music, background noise and hubbub, air raid sirens, and all manner of strange noises. He also said that he thought he saw moving shadows. He wouldn't stay there alone after his first night. I personally never saw much. The one thing I do remember is finding bottles between the cavities and the walls which I thought was a strange thing. We did uncover a cellar that had been boarded over, but there was nothing down there. Eventually the job was done and I left the site. I live near Pevely, Missouri, not far from the Mississippi River. This incident took place on June 30th, 2018, about 1 a.m. I was having trouble sleeping since it was very warm and I was restless. I went outside onto the back porch to smoke and I saw a small yellow light in the sky in front of me. 
I didn't think much of it, but it was getting closer. I moved a bit to my left in order to get a better look, and it suddenly stopped. I stood still and continued watching it. About a minute later, I noticed two more lights approaching from the same direction. There was now a large, dim yellow light and two smaller bright lights. One was white, the other orange. The orange light then flashed brightly and then there was a loud bang a second later. The white light disappeared, but the orange light started to come towards me while the dim yellow light seemed to observe what was going on from a distance. I was becoming more curious and attempted to signal it to come closer, but it stopped and started to back away until it disappeared. I was mesmerized by this activity and continued to observe. The orange light then reappeared, accompanied by a white light. The lights were dancing around the sky, going in all different directions. I stood there, lit another cigarette, and watched the lights for about 15 minutes. Then I heard a distinct growling sound coming from the woods behind the house. I could literally hear this thing walking through the brush, cracking limbs as it moved closer. It was growling and snarling. As it moved closer to me, I could see white orbs of various sizes flying throughout the woods. Then the growling and footfalls stopped. After a few seconds, I heard what sounded like someone was calling my name from a distance. There was another call from another direction. I was beginning to get scared, but I wanted to know what this was. Then suddenly a loud roar emanated from the edge of the woods. It was so terrifying that I lost the use of my legs. I quickly gathered myself and ran into the house and locked the door. I peeked out the kitchen window and attempted to take photos of the orbs, but the phone went dead. I just charged the damn thing. I didn't hear any more roars or sounds, and the orbs soon disappeared. The next day, July 1st, I called my neighbor who lives down the road on a small farm. I asked her if she had heard or seen anything the previous night. She replied by telling me that something got into her barn and killed two turkeys, but she never heard or saw anything. I asked her if I could come over and look around, and she agreed. As I looked around the barn, I didn't see anything unusual, but her livestock was very skittish. Her dogs and cat never came outside and were hunkered down in the barn. I don't know what killed the turkeys, but I have no doubt it was the same thing in the woods behind my house. I later walked through the woods and didn't see anything out of the ordinary, but there was what I would call an electric or static charge that affected me as I walked around and actually gave me a bad headache. I decided to contact you in regards to this experience because I haven't felt well since then. I'm very weak and have trouble keeping my food down. If it gets worse, I may need to go to the doctor. Have you heard or read any similar situations like this? My brother believes that this was a Bigfoot, but it still doesn't explain the lights, the orbs, the voices, and how I feel. I had a series of phone calls that I can only describe as ghostly. A few months ago, just after Christmas, I started to get calls from an unknown number. At first, I thought it was a sales call or some scam, but the calls kept coming through, and I ended up answering one. All I heard was static and what sounded like a scratching noise. I hung up, and I got another call about 20 minutes later. Again, it was the same thing. The third call was the same. The fourth was stronger scratching, and the fifth was strange. I thought I could make out mumbling on the line. I kept getting these calls for weeks, and then they suddenly stopped. I haven't had one for a while now. Now, this could just be a bad line, but I've never heard of calls like this, and I swear I could hear mumbling on the line. After some research on the internet, I discovered that people do receive ghost calls, but I don't know if this would be considered that. 
I didn't hear anything apart from what I thought was mumbling and scratching. It was like it used to be on the radio when the station wasn't quite tuned in enough. Mumbling and static that made no sense. My mother was very interested in the paranormal and would often attend sessions with mediums in the 1950s and 60s, back when it was popular. One time, she was hoping to get in contact with her own mother, who had died before the war. The medium asked my mother to bring her mother's favorite kind of flowers, lilies, with her to the seance. My mother bought the flowers and arrived at the seance with my grandfather to make contact. The medium took the flowers, put them in a vase, and placed them in the middle of the table. She told my mother and grandfather that it would encourage her spirit to appear. The seance then began, and nothing happened. My mother left without talking to her mother. The medium was a fraud, apparently. A few years later, after my mother had married and had just had her first baby, she got a delivery of flowers sent to her just out of the blue. The flowers were lilies. My mother called several of the local flower shops who told her they hadn't delivered them. So my mother always believed that the flowers came as an acknowledgement from her mother, which was lovely. I often wonder about this, too. It could have been a mix-up. There were a lot of flower shops who could have delivered them, but they could have come from her mother. It's the fact that they were lilies that's the weird thing. This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. War brings with it violence, horror, strife, and madness. Among all of the chaos and bloodshed, there can be some rather strange incidents indeed, and across the ages there have been various accounts of something very strange going on behind the scenes of our relentless drive to kill ourselves. Although there are plenty of reports of the killing and death of war, What's not often reported upon are the numerous cases of strange sightings and phenomena that seem to be going on as well. Perhaps some of the most bizarre of these are the baffling and sinister entities that have been seen in wartime, of a decidedly supernatural, perhaps even demonic, nature. Here's a selection of wartime encounters with creatures and beings that seem to lie beyond our current understanding of the world as we know it. One rather obscure but terrifying account originates in October of 1943 among the cacophony of death and chaos of the German bombings of London. As the citizens cowered in their homes fearfully awaiting the next bombing shudder of the ground from another bomb, a military group called the ARP air raid precautions, stalked through streets painted by the flickering of the glow of explosions and picked through the rubble of the massacre in an effort to salvage as many lives as they could. One of these men was named Howard Leland, and he was to find something perhaps far worse than the enemy here in this war-torn wasteland. At some point, the ground 
heaved with the wrath of a particularly close bomb strike, and Leland allegedly ducked into a quaking abandoned house to take shelter as the structure rained dust and debris down upon him. As it was night, he used his flashlight to pierce through the murk, particles of dust dislodged by the bomb strike hovering and dancing in the beam of light. He made his way to the top of a darkened stairwell that descended down into a pitch black that his feeble light could not shake off, and he nevertheless stumbled down to the bottom of a cellar, where he reportedly crouched down to wait out the enemy bombing run, praying that the building he was in would not be the next to be disintegrated into rubble. As he waited there for either the bombs to stop or for himself to die, he purportedly began to get the very strong feeling that he was being watched, that eyes were lying heavily upon him, a feeling that would evolve into a palpable sense of thick dread. Sitting there in the dark silence, Leland reportedly shone his flashlight up to the top of the stairs and caught in its beam the horrifying sight of what looked like a massive cat-like beast crouching at the topmost step with large, incandescent eyes and horns protruding from its head. Leland would later explain that the monstrous entity had seemed to exude icy waves of an aura of evil and that its unblinking eyes had had a hypnotic quality that held him in a trance. As he sat there, transfixed by the entity's gaze, it suddenly leapt from the step to come pouncing down toward him as an unearthly howl reverberated through the still air. Yet before it hit the ground, it seemed to evaporate into thin air, breaking him from whatever spell it had kept him in. At that same moment, he said that he had heard human voices and footsteps, and that some of his fellow ARP members had then emerged from the gloom to his rescue. Leland told them what had happened in a panic, but none of the other men reported having come across anything strange in the house and had not heard the bone-chilling wail he described. However, much to Leland's surprise, some of the other men in the unit claimed that a very similar shadowy cat-like beast with horns and glowing eyes had been spotted by others in the same vicinity. Apparently, Leland would be so disturbed by his harrowing encounter with the unexplained that he would visit a clairvoyant named John Pendragon, who was allegedly immediately able to divine the location of the house on a map of London. With some digging into the history of the house, it would turn out that one of the previous owners had been an occultist and black magician who had routinely used cats for sacrifices in dark, arcane rituals. It seems that this sinister individual had gone mad and then hung himself at the top of those stairs, after which the cat monster had been spotted over the years. This caused Pendragon to come to the conclusion that the entity that Leland had seen was perhaps some sort of elemental spirit or demon that had taken on a feline form due to absorbing the history of cat violence that permeated the structure. The account was written of in both Pendragon's autobiography, entitled simply Pendragon, in 1968, as well as Brad Steiger's book Bizarre Cats in 1993, and remains a truly bizarre account of the unexplained from World War II. Another type of vaguely demonic entity supposedly seen during World War II were devilish-looking little beasts known as gremlins. These gnome-like, somewhat reptilian creatures were often reported especially by pilots during the war on all sides of the conflict and were often blamed for technical mishaps, malfunctions, and freak accidents. One particularly strange example of such an account comes from a man identified only as L.W., who was a Boeing B-17 pilot during the war and not only believes that many plane failures were due to the activities of these mischievous creatures, but also claims to have had a close encounter of his own with one of them. LW claimed that during one mission, his aircraft had sudden technical difficulties, and that when he investigated, he came face to face with the legendary gremlins, which he said were about three feet tall with hairless gray skin 
long pointy ears and red eyes. He would say of what happened thus. So I am very aware of my surroundings and as I go higher, I notice an unusual sound coming from the engine. The instruments went nuts. I look at my right and I see an entity staring at me. Then I look at the aircraft's nose and there it is, another one hanging in there. Dancing lizards. I was perfectly fine, my senses were in good shape, but the weird things were still there looking at me. They kept going at it, pounding the plane with all their might. They appeared to be laughing with their big mouths open, looking at me, hitting the plane with long arms, trying to pull stuff. I have no doubt in my mind that they were trying to crash it. I managed to stabilize the flight and I saw the critters falling off the aircraft. I don't know if they fell and died or if they jumped from my plane to a different one. I have no idea. There are numerous similar reports from throughout World War II, and whether these creatures were ever real at all or just the product of addled minds, they remain at least curious accounts of something decidedly supernatural in nature going on during World War II. In later years, we have a case of very demonic creatures supposedly encountered during the Vietnam War from 1955 to 1975, which was related by a witness who claims to have been a U.S. Army corporal during the war. He claims that in 1970, he was second in command of a squad of soldiers operating in a thickly jungled remote area just south of the demilitarized zone. The witness claims that they had set up a biovac in an area of steep hills and had then set out on a night patrol of the surrounding vicinity. They encountered what they took to be enemy activity and hunkered down to wait it out, during which time they got only fleeting glimpses of something moving through the brush. When the activity died down, they continued through the valley they were in until they hit a sheer wall of stone that oddly looked as if someone had stacked enormous boulders in front of it. A cave entrance was also visible, which looked to have been cleanly carved into solid rock. It was very unlike anything they knew of enemy caves, and they decided to get a closer look. As they approached, a fetid, putrid smell like rotting eggs and human decay began to pervade the area which seemed to be bellowing out of the cave opening. So bad was the stench that several squad members reportedly fell physically ill, vomiting in the bushes. They took up positions in the jungle near the entrance and waited as they discerned strange rumbling sounds from below. As dawn began to come, something very strange happened indeed, of which the witness says, just when we noticed the movement in front of the cave, a being, I first thought it was a man, moved through the entrance into the clearing in front of the cave. As it stood up from a crouch, it stood at least seven foot high and started to look in our direction. At that time, another similar-looking creature was moving out of the cave. They were making hellish hissing sounds and looking directly at us. The only way I can describe these beings is that they looked like upright lizards. The scaly, shiny skin was very dark, almost black. Snake-like faces with forward-set eyes that were very large. They had arms and legs like a human, but with scaly skin. I didn't notice a tail, though they wore long one-piece dark green robes along with a dark cap-like covering on their heads. I never noticed if they had anything on their feet. No one gave the order, it seemed like the entire squad opened fire at once. Every piece of vegetation between us and them was quickly sheared away. I yelled out a ceasefire order at the same time I was looking in the direction of the cave. There was nothing there. We immediately checked our flank in case those things circled around us, but there was nothing. As we approached the cave, ready to resume action if needed, it became apparent that the beings had escaped most likely back into the cave. It was soon decided to set charges and close the cave entrance. When we returned to camp, we all seemed to be in a daze. There was little discussion of the incident and we were never debriefed, so I know the sergeant never filed a report. Then again, if he did, 
it was kept quiet by the brass. It is a very strange account to be sure, if it's true at all. Moving on into later years are reports from U.S. military personnel stationed at Hahn Air Base at Morbach, Germany, during the Cold War in the 1980s. According to soldiers at the base, a strange wolf-like creature prowling about on two legs was spotted from time to time, with one particularly harrowing account coming from 1988. According to the reports, one evening a group of Air Force personnel were at the base when the sirens began shrieking into the dark, indicating that something had tripped an alarm somewhere. Base personnel went to investigate and apparently came across a bipedal wolf-like monstrosity standing around eight or nine feet in height, which gazed menacingly at the soldiers before clearing a ten-foot fall fence with apparent ease. When a tracker dog was brought in, it apparently became overwhelmed with fear at the location of the sighting, cowering and trembling with terror. At the time, it seems that no one knew of a persistent legend in the area of a creature that spans back to the time of Napoleon. According to the tales, a man named Johannes Baptist Schweitzer and some others had deserted Napoleon's army and fled towards his homeland, eventually finding himself in the German town of Wittlich, where they murder the family of a farmer whose land they had been stealing from. The legend says that the farmer's wife cursed Schweitzer to become a howling beast on the full moon, after which the soldier had killed her as well. The stories say the curse worked and that he became a beast at the full moon to murder, rape, and pillage as a bipedal, wolf-like abomination, continuing his reign until he was killed by a lynch mob of villagers. It is speculated that this legend may have had something to do with what the U.S. personnel saw, and an anthropologist from the College of Mainz by the name of Matthias Burgard even checked out these reports to uncover several reports of a bipedal wolfman in the area. What was going on here? No one seems to really know, and tales of the Morbach monster continue to circulate. Coming into the 2000s, we have the war in Afghanistan, which produced some strange accounts as well. One is that of a man named Jerry Aberdeen, who in 2004 was stationed in Mosul, Nineveh province. He told a very strange story of a seemingly demonic creature encountered out in these badlands. He would say of this weird incident, I was attached to two-thirds infantry, three SBCT and FOB Patriot. A call went out on the radio that FOB Diamondback, the airfield, was under attack. Everyone on every FOB, from Courage, Blickenstaff, Patriot and Maris, jumped into the closest vehicle and headed to the airfield to counter the attack. I was in a vehicle with some other infantry guys, an engineer and a PSYOPs guy. When we got to the airfield, we saw some dudes trying to climb over the wall. The gunner opened up on them, and the rest of us took up a position in a ditch on the other side of the road and opened fire. There were three of us side by side, the engineer, the PSYOPs guy, and myself. We fired at one guy and he dropped from the top of the wall. Hard to tell who actually shot him. Right after he fell, there was a stream of black smoke coming out of him. The engineer made that comment that he must have been wearing a suicide vest and it malfunctioned. A few seconds later, the black smoke grew larger and started to take a human-looking form. What happened next, all three of us saw, and there was no doubt. The now fully materialized black smoke was standing upright and now had red, smoky, glowing eyes and a weird-looking mouth. The damn thing actually smiled at us and turned to sort of run, but it just dissipated after it took a few steps. Very hard to describe how it all happened. All three of us just looked at each other wide-eyed for a second or two. After it was all over, we only spoke about it once, then never again. Was this a demon? A ghost? Spectre? Or what? It's hard to say. There are also reports of what seem to be actual vampires in Afghanistan. One investigator, reporter, and former U.S. Marine named Tim King, who spent months in the Afghanistan combat theater covering a variety of military operations for SalemNews.com and Oregon's KPTV Fox 12, 
wrote of such a thing in a 2007 article for Salem News entitled, Vampires in Afghanistan? Soldiers Say It's True. According to King, during his travels he met an American soldier at the Bagram Airfield in Afghanistan who would tell him a bizarre tale indeed. The soldier asked King if he knew about the vampire problem in the area, something the reporter had not once heard of in his entire time in the country. Intrigued, King asked for more information on what the soldier was talking about, who obliged by claiming that the vampires were said to live deep in the desert, that they were quite a bit taller than normal humans, and that they were frequently women. He claimed the people of the area had known about these sinister creatures for centuries, that they came out in the dark and stalked the desert badlands and mountains at night looking for victims, and that they were indeed often thought to be responsible for people going missing without a trace. The soldier would then tell King, They are really terrified of them. It scares people half to death if they just think once around. They come out at night, sometimes people coming up missing, especially kids. They even pull their animals inside when the vampires are out. It's been going on for hundreds of years here. People in other parts of the world don't even know about it, but anyone who's lived around here does. Guys are scared, you're damn right. They know there isn't a thing anyone can do about it if one of them decides to come after you. You just stick with other people and hope for the best sometimes. War brings with it monsters. Of that there can be no doubt. Yet among the human monsters that congeal out of the darkness of conflict also seem to be those which are of a more uncertain origin. Are these the result of stressed minds plagued by the specters of war? Are they just tall tales and superstitions? Or are these perhaps a peek into the world of strange entities prowling the fringes of the suffering we bring upon each other, perhaps feeding upon the terror of it all? There, within the cracks of all the reports of war, we will continue to uncover such anomalous cases and wonder just what it all means. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.